Well, good morning, uh, Pastor Chris. We are uh, continuing a series that we started last week on the book of Acts. So if you want to turn there to the book of Acts or click or swipe or tap or do what you need to do to get to the book of Acts. It's the fifth book in the New Testament, and we are in chapter one, chapter one of the book of Acts. And we're going to be starting in verse 15 this morning. Acts chapter one, verse 15 through the end of the chapter. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120. And said, brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, Akadama, which is field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all of the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, you, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them. And the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Uh, The Old Testament is long. It's more than three times as long as the New Testament. And if we're honest, most of us probably don't have as good an understanding of the Old Testament as we do the New Testament. And that's one of the reasons why uh, we tend to bounce back and forth here at Gateway between the Old Testament and the New Testament in our preaching, is to kind of develop that familiarity. We're looking at the book of Acts right now, but before that it was the Minor Prophets in the Old Testament. Before that, it was 1 Peter in the New, then Proverbs in the Old Testament, Colossians in the New, and then the Pentateuch, and then Luke, and before that, 1 Samuel. You get the idea. We need the Old Testament because Christianity isn't a new religion that was put in place of the Old Testament Israelite religion. That's not what Christianity is. We need the Old Testament because Christianity is a fulfillment of the Old Testament Israelite religion. I I think we have this idea in our heads that sometimes uh, that under the Old Covenant, things were bleak and they were bleary and they were dark and they were depressing and they were painful. And then Jesus came and he changed all that. And that's just not the message of the Bible. The Old Testament, if you read it, it's just as hopeful and encouraging and as full of life as the New Testament. Rather than standing in contrast with the Old Testament, the New Testament clarifies and crystallizes the Old Testament. And in Jesus, all the promises of the Old Covenant, of the Old Testament, are kept. So if you fully want to understand Jesus, you need to understand the promises that are fulfilled in Jesus. Now that's maybe a strange introduction to my sermon this morning, but there's a reason for it. Because on the surface of this passage, Acts 1, verses 15 through 26, it might seem strange or unnecessary, even pointless. You've probably not dwelt on this passage much. Instead, when you've read the book of Acts, if you've read the book of Acts, You've probably raced through chapter 1 to get to the excitement that begins in chapter 2. And we'll get there next week. What do we make of Peter quoting obscure scripture references? The fate of Judas. The names of two men otherwise forgotten by history. Not to mention the rest of the book of Acts where they don't appear. What do we make of the casting of lots? It's all a little bit odd to our ears. Yet... For Luke, the author of uh, 
this two-volume set that we call the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, everything has been carefully constructed, carefully put together to tell the story of Jesus. So this must be important. Luke wants us to know something. Jesus is restoring Israel. Jesus is restoring Israel. Now, if you're a Christian and you grew up in America, you have one of two thoughts. Either, what does Jesus have to do with Israel? To which the answer is, a lot. Or you're thinking, oh yeah, I know that he's going to do all that before the tribulation, and then there'll be a rapture, and then, but no, that's not what we're talking about. So we're going to go a little different direction here because I think to understand the Bible faithfully, we have to go a little different direction here. But we cannot, despite what something might tell you, we cannot unhitch Jesus from the Old Testament. We cannot unhitch the New Testament from the Old Testament. We need the Old Testament to make sense of the New Testament. We're going to look at three things that this passage brings up. And for the sake of memory, we'll call them the snag the scriptures, and the solution. The stag, the scriptures, and the solution. And then we're going to pull these threads together and answer the question, so what? What's this mean for us? We'll begin with the snag. And and the snag, or, or the hiccup, the problem that is brought up in this passage is that we kick off with someone missing. We saw last week that it was hinted at. Luke starts this book reminding us that this is a continuation of the gospel of Luke. And that it's all about the things that Jesus, even though he had left earth, was continuing to do. Jesus is still at work. Only now he was going to do his work through his spirit-empowered apostles and disciples. That's the big change. And in verse 13, which we looked at last week, Luke listed the apostles. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. But there's a snag, because that's 11 names. And Jesus had chosen 12 apostles. But there's only 11 here. Why are there only 11 And why is that a problem? Good questions. Glad you asked. Why there's only 11? This passage begins with Peter addressing what appears to have been a full group of Christians, roughly 120 people. And he reminds them about Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. Judas Iscariot who is a different Judas than the one we just read, Judas, the son of James. Judas was a common name back then. He betrayed Jesus. You know, we don't know a lot about Judas. The apostle John tells us that Judas was in charge of the finances for Jesus' ministry, and that he would sometimes steal from the offering bag. He was an embezzler. Not that we see that in churches today. So he's not a, he was never a particularly honest fellow. And he was definitely motivated by money. And when it became clear that the Jewish authorities wanted to arrest and kill Jesus, but needed to do, a, do it in a way that was apart from the crowds of people who were favorably uh, impressed with Jesus, Judas comes up and offers that to lead them to Jesus at a convenient time for a sum of money. As a result of this, Judas has gone down in history with a horrible reputation. If you call someone a Judas, you're calling them a a traitor, someone who cannot be trusted. But it's worth remembering that all of Jesus' apostles left him to a greater or lesser degree. All of them fled Jesus after he was arrested. In Luke chapter 22, Jesus famously warned Peter, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. 
And of course, his prediction came true as, as Peter denied having anything to do with Jesus or even having known him in order to protect himself from facing the same fate. So if all of the apostles abandoned Jesus, why does Judas get a bad rap? Well, I think there's two reasons why Judas gets a particularly bad rap. And first, obviously, Judas essentially brought about Jesus' death. He was complicit in a murderous act of injustice. And on a very surface level, we know that bringing about murder is worse than hiding. Okay, so we, we do understand that on a basic level. But the, I think the second reason is more important, and it's more telling. To use the example of Peter again, in that same passage in Luke 22, Jesus had said to Peter, Simon, Simon, Peter also went by the name Simon, 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 behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. You see, despite Peter's denials of Jesus, his faith did not ultimately fail. Instead, he turned again. It's a word that means to turn around. And, and it can be used as a metaphor in the scriptures for repentance. When Peter denies knowing Jesus, he essentially has oriented his entire life away from God, away from Jesus, away from life. But when he repents, he turns. And the orientation of his life, the direction of his life is changed. And it's oriented squarely on Jesus. And so you see the biggest difference between Judas and Peter is that Peter repented and Judas did not. It may be true that Judas was the greatest sinner who ever walked on earth. I don't know. But what I do know is that despite the fact that he gave up Jesus to be executed, to be murdered, he could still have found favor with God if only his remorse had led him to repentance. In the same way, no matter what, what you've done, it, it's not too late or too hard by God's power to turn around. The blood of Jesus Christ was not shed on the cross for righteous people. The blood of Jesus was shed on the cross for sinful people, for wicked people, for mistake-prone people, for messed-up people, people like me and people like you. But Judas did not repent. Instead, his remorse drove him in the opposite direction, and he committed suicide. Many people, sadly, when they are overcome with their own failures, turn to suicide. 47,500 people, more than that, actually, in 2019, committed suicide in the United States. But suicide is unnecessary. Because our value does not need to be fixed by the price of our failures, or our inadequacies, or our sins. Rather, our value can be fixed by the price Jesus paid on the cross. In other words, when we receive Christ's forgiveness and we trust that Jesus died on the cross in payment of my sins, then we realize the value that I have is not dependent on me, but dependent on Jesus who gave his life for me. And that's a very different valuation. But Judas missed the heart of Jesus' message. And though he was chosen by Jesus to be among the twelve, he turned his back on Jesus and he never returned. And as a result, they were down one. That's why they only had eleven. Why, why does that matter? Why does it matter that they only had 11? And a, a big hint of this is in verse 6 from last week. Luke writes, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? 
See, the apostles understood that Jesus was going to, in some way, restore Israel. It's clear from Jesus' answer to them that they still did not know what that meant. But Jesus was not done with Israel. In fact, in Luke chapter 22 again, Jesus said to the 11, Judas had already left to go betray Jesus, and so it was just Jesus and the 11 at that time. You are those who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assign to you, as my Father assigned to me, a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So what's going on? In the Old Testament, Israel was chosen to be God's special people. We tend to think of Israel as the same thing as Jewish, but that's not really accurate. The term Jew or Jewish came about much later. Instead, Israel was the people of God's promises. God had embarked on a rescue plan to save human beings from their wickedness. And as a part of that, God chose a man, Abraham, and his son Isaac, and his son, Jacob, or came known to be Israel, to be a line of blessing for the whole earth. He formed Israel and Israel's 12 sons into a nation, a nation from which he would bring about his special king, the Messiah, who we know as Jesus. But you know, Israel wasn't a single ethnic group in the way that we think of ethnic groups today. Instead, all sorts of ethnicities joined with this nation called Israel. You can read about them in the Old Testament. But over time, the nation became corrupted. It was supposed to be a people that worshipped Yahweh, the one true God. And, and God blessed them. And as God blessed them, that they would be a light to the people of the world to draw people from all over the world, from everywhere, to worship Yahweh. But throughout the Old Testament, we see pockets of faithfulness in Israel, often overshadowed by unfaithfulness. But Jesus was the fulfillment of everything that Israel was supposed to be. He was, you might say, the perfect, true Israelite. And he was building a new people, or we might say a renewed people, based on how people responded to him. And as a model of that, ancient Israel had 12 representatives, 12 sons of the man named Israel. So Jesus had 12 representatives in his 12 apostles. Remember, we said last week an apostle is an authorized representative who speaks with the full authority of the one who sends him. And that's what these 12 apostles were supposed to be, Jesus' authorized representatives. But in Acts 1.15, there's only 11. If this was going to be a new or renewed people of God, then it was a problem that one of Jesus' 12 divine representatives was missing. That's the snag. Jesus is creating a new people in the model of Israel. Israel has 12 tribes, 12 representatives. Jesus, in following that model, will have 12 representatives who judge the 12 tribes of Israel. So there's the snag. And that brings us to the, the second point of, of our outline this morning, the, the scriptures. In verse 16, Peter began by saying, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas. And then in verse 20, he says, For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. Now, I want to highlight this for for two reasons. Uh, first, Peter and Luke thought it was apparently important to highlight, so there's that. And second, I think it can be a little bit confusing for people when they look at these verses and try to make sense of them and start to dig into, okay, what were those passages in the Old Testament and how do they relate? Peter cites two Psalms here. Psalm 69, Psalm 109. Both of these psalms have a title that lists David as the author. And in citing these psalms, Peter gives us a very nice synopsis of the Christian doctrine of Scripture. It's not really what this passage is all about, but this is a great proof text. 
Um, Peter says that these psalms were spoken by the Holy Spirit, but they were spoken by the mouth of David. And the Christian understanding of the Bible is that it's a collection of writings that were composed by men under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit so that they are fully divine books. They are the words of God. But they are also God's messages spoken through real human beings who lived in real times and real places and spoke real human languages like Hebrew and Aramaic and Koine Greek. In this case, the real human being was David, the king of Israel. David was not a perfect man. But in what he got right, his faithfulness to God, he became a model of what godly leadership was supposed to be in ancient Israel. David was not just a king. He was also a prophet. And his many psalms that are recorded in the Bible are indicative of that. Because of David's faithfulness, God promised to build David a dynasty. He promised that David would always have a descendant to sit on the throne. And as God's promises became more and more clear over time, as the revelation of more scripture through more of God's prophets happened, the Israelites began to look forward to a singular son of David, a unique son of David a king who would take the throne to restore Israel, the Messiah. So David was not just the ideal king, the ideal ruler. He was also a foreshadow of a great king who was to come. Jesus is that king. The ancient Jews like early Christians, saw many of David's writings, not just as expressions of his own heart, which they were, but also as pointing forward to the Messiah, the Christ, that is, Jesus. Psalm 69 and 109 were both psalms that David wrote from a place of pain and trouble. In both, he's being confronted with injustice, that's directed at him. In Psalm 69, he wrote, More in number than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without cause. Mighty are those who would destroy me, those who attack me with lies. What did I steal that I must now restore? And in Psalm 109, David wrote, Be not silent, O God of my praise. For wicked and deceitful mouths are opened against me, speaking against me with lying tongues. They encircled me with words of hate and attacked me without cause. In return for my love, they accuse me, but I give myself to prayer. So they reward me evil for good and hatred for my love. So in these psalms, God's anointed king is unjustly, unfairly being attacked and maliciously accused of things he did not do. Now Peter said that David's words need to be fulfilled. But notice that Peter does not say that the words must come true. He didn't say that. David was not making a prediction about what would happen in the future, not the way we, we normally think about it. David was not like psychically telling the world, this is what will happen in the future. Rather, David, as a precursor of the king to come, Jesus, was writing words that would reach their ultimate meaning in Jesus Christ. Peter knew that David's words would find their ultimate significance in that one king, King Jesus. The words needed to be fulfilled, brought to their fullest and richest meaning. So David was unjustly attacked and unfairly slandered, but those words were fulfilled in Jesus. No one in history was more unjustly attacked and were unfairly slandered than Jesus, who did 
no wrong. In those same Psalms, David expresses a wish for those who came after him so wrongly. Just as the words of unjust suffering find their ultimate fulfillment in Jesus, so the consequences for those who unjustly betrayed David released, uh, reached their ultimate fulfillment in Judas, the ultimate betrayer. So as, as a quick aside, whenever you read the Old Testament, ask yourself this question. Where is Jesus? Where is Jesus? Remember that after his resurrection, Jesus appeared to two of his disciples, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures, or in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. All of it points to Jesus. He's there. And you can bet that if you're reading about David, there's a good chance it's pointing directly to Jesus. So no, you're not David fighting Goliath in all of your struggles. Jesus is slaying the Goliath of sin. No, you're not David, the heroic, manly man rescuing your country. Jesus is the heroic, manly man saving a people for himself. When you think you see yourself in the Bible, make sure you know where Jesus is first, because he's there. So as Peter studied the scriptures, and having learned from Jesus how all the scriptures point to Jesus, he saw two things. First, Judas' place should be wiped out. Judas was disqualified from the ministry. And so that created a vacancy in this 12-man ministry. The apostles were supposed to have a permanent position. We'll get to that more in a second. But if Jesus was going to have the apostles judging the 12 tribes of Israel in the final judgment, then these were clearly permanent positions. Not just for this life, but into the next life, for eternity. But Judas had forfeited his position. Second, there needed to be a replacement. Judas couldn't have his place anymore. Judas's camp would be empty, but someone should take his place. If Jesus was going to build a renewed Israel, it needed 12 leaders. So then, what was the solution? Let's look at the solution. Peter said, so one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become a witness with us to his resurrection. Now there's a lot to unpack there because Peter's words tell us how he understood the role and qualifications of an apostle. And so besides helping us to understand what an apostle is, this word that we toss around and see in the Bible and maybe we don't understand fully, it also helps us to understand what an apostle is not, which is really important because there are a lot of people all over the world claiming to be apostles. They're not. And we'll see why. Because an apostle was someone who had been with the company of Jesus Christ followers during his earthly ministry. And not just a part of the earthly ministry, but the whole thing. Peter said an apostle was someone who was around from the days of John the Baptist through the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. So they had to be with Jesus at the very beginning of his ministry through the very end of Jesus' ministry. Now, I don't want to confuse things too much, but I do think the Bible, uh, the, the term apostle was a common term in that time period, and so the Bible does use the term apostle in more than one sense, and I think it does speak of uh, apostles in a lesser sense than uh, the 12. Uh, we see that with 
guys like the Apostle Paul, who had similar but slightly different qualifications. But, but that's for another day. For these primary apostles, they needed someone who had been with the ministry since the beginning. One way you know that these guys are not around anymore is that there's nobody alive today, to my knowledge, who was there at the beginning of Jesus' ministry and there through the end of Jesus' ministry. But how do they find these guys? Well, the, Luke says that they put forward two individuals, and we don't know how they chose them. It could be that they did a search of the whole group of 120 people and there was only two men who fit the qualifications that Peter had laid out. Or maybe these were the only two that were willing to be considered. We're not told. We just know that the 120 or so people proposed two individuals. There's a man named Joseph who was also called or nicknamed the son of the Sabbath. That's what Barsabbas means. And he's also got a Latin name, Justice which was common back then, especially uh, if a Jewish person spent a lot of time in the non-Jewish Roman world. He might take on an extra name that he used in those contexts. And we see that pretty commonly in America. If you meet somebody uh, from another country, especially if their language is one that's hard to pronounce in English, sometimes they'll just take an English name to get around when they're in America. And, and since this guy has three names, we might get the impression that he's somewhat important. He's somewhat prominent. But we don't know much else about him. Next to him is Matthias, and that's all we got on him. He's Matthias. And what happens next is fascinating, so don't miss it. They pray. You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. So notice who they pray to. They pray to the Lord. Now in verse 6, the apostles spoke to Jesus, and they called him Lord. And when laying out the qualifications of an apostle, Peter spoke of the Lord Jesus. And so with little doubt then, the disciples here are praying, in verse 24 and 25, to Jesus. And we'll see this throughout the book of Acts. The word Lord almost always refers to Jesus as opposed to, say, the Father. They say then that Jesus is the one who knows the hearts of all. Think about that. They say that Jesus is omniscient. He's all-knowing of the depths of the human heart. There is no one in this room who has omniscient knowledge of the depths of the human heart. You don't even have insight into the depths of your own heart. And yet they can refer to Jesus as the one who knows the hearts of all. Then they ask Jesus to show which of the two men he had chosen. So remember, the apostles were Jesus' choice. And so they're giving this choice to Jesus also. They believe and they have confidence that Jesus, even though he has gone from earth, is still at work. And then they cast lots. Casting lots was an ancient practice. I'm sure it's probably still done in some places. And there's a lot of different ways you could do it, but you could think of it as something like rolling a dice uh, or drawing lottery balls. And you, might sound, you might think that that sounds a lot like random chance. But not for a person of faith. See, for the person of faith, it was nothing like chance at all. In Proverbs chapter 16, verse 33, we read, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from Yahweh. The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from Yahweh. There is no true randomness to the universe. God is sovereign over everything, even the turning of a die. These disciples are fully trusting they're fully trusting that the results of their casting of lots will be the revealed will 
of Jesus. So we have the disciples praying to Jesus. We have the disciples convinced that he is all-knowing and confident that he can do what the scriptures say belong to Yahweh alone, that he can control the outworking of the roll of a die from heaven. In short, they are acknowledging that Jesus is God. Jesus is God. And then Luke writes, and they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. So the lot fell on the guy who was apparently the less significant of the two. And they were 12 again. Now, Matthias is interesting. You know, he's interesting because what do we know about him? Nothing. We know nothing about him. He is never mentioned in the Bible again. We know no history of this man really outside of the Bible. He is one of the 12 apostles. He's chosen by the risen Jesus to be Jesus' special witness. That means he'll sit on a throne next to Peter and James and John and the rest judging the 12 tribes of Israel. He's kind of important. And yet we know nothing about him. There's a few stories from early Christian writers. Maybe he went to Cappadocia. Maybe he went to Ethiopia. Maybe he died of old age. Maybe he was stoned to death. These are some of the stories we have. But they're not, they're not in the Bible, and they're late. They're not written around this time period. And they contradict each other. And so the end result is we know nothing about Matthias. And yet he's really, really important in the plan of God. You know who was really famous around the same time? Emperor Nero. There's history books written about Emperor Nero. We know the whole genealogy of Emperor Nero. We know who alive today is related to Emperor Nero. But Nero wasn't chosen to be an apostle by Jesus. As far as we know, he wasn't even chosen to be a follower of Jesus. The great names of history are not necessarily the great names in God's book of life. We can be remembered in history books. We can be remembered on plaques. We can be remembered on the sides of buildings. But what will that matter if we're not remembered in eternity? You know, there are probably, even in this small room, there are probably people in this room who will be remembered better in history than Matthias. But Matthias' exploits, the places he went, the things he did in the name of being a witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, those things are known by God. And they will be remembered by God unto eternity. Sometimes making your life count means being forgotten by history. Sometimes making your life count means being forgotten by history in the name of being remembered by God. Let me give you another quick Side, you might be wondering if Jesus is sovereign over the lot, should we as Christians be casting lots? And without going into a big ordeal, let me just say no. A um, couple reasons. The disciples never again in the book of Acts or anywhere else in the Bible cast lots. And I think that's because soon they wouldn't need to. Soon, the very next chapter, they would receive what Jesus spoke about in the beginning of this chapter. They would receive power when the Holy Spirit came upon them. Christians don't cast lots because we have the Holy Spirit. So, the disciples had a snag. They were supposed to be 12 apostles, and they had 11. They looked to the scriptures, and they found a solution. And Jesus, from heaven, selected a 12th apostle. 
So what, right? Why does this matter? Well, Luke was writing to Theophilus, who was very likely curious what this Christian movement was all about. And maybe you're like Theophilus. Maybe you're trying to understand what Christianity is all about. On the other hand, maybe you're already a Christian, but for us who are already Christians, sometimes a big part of the Christian faith gets buried in our cultural assumptions and our cultural preferences, like our language or our country or our style or those sorts of things. And, and so for both of those groups, let me suggest this. If Jesus is restoring Israel, here's the upshot. It means that Jesus is at work to create a new people for himself. Jesus is at work creating a new people for himself. See, the Christian faith is not just a set of beliefs you hold or don't hold. We recited the, uh, the Creed of 325 this morning, the original version of the Nicene Creed, and it has in it a number of beliefs that Christians have held since the beginning of the Christian movement, and that is fantastic, and it is wonderful, and we cherish those beliefs, but Christianity is not just a thing that we believe. It's part of Christianity, but that's too individualistic. If that's what Christianity would, was, and that is what many Christians think it is, unfortunately, then we could simply believe a bunch of things and then go on and live our life the way that we want to live our lives because we have those beliefs. But that's not Christianity. Christianity is Jesus building those followers, those believers, into a new people, a new community, a new Israel. Just like in the Old Testament, an Israelite didn't just believe that Yahweh was the one true God. You did not have Israelites thinking, oh, I believe that Yahweh is the one true God, and now I'm just going to go off and, and, and live in Germany because I can, and I'll do some German things. No, they created a unique culture filled with a shared history and shared experience and shared commitments to each other and shared religious devotion. It was supposed to be a community. And Jesus isn't changing that. He's fulfilling that. He's not replacing that. He's fulfilling that. Jesus' people are called to a unique culture, a Christian culture, a unique history, a Christian history. Jesus' followers are not just a bunch of people who believe in him and are scattered over this place and that place. They are a new community of people with a, a new set of ethics, a Christian ethics, a different set of commitments, Christian commitments. We have our own history, our own experiences, and we are uniquely devoted to each other, and we share in worship together. Now, pretty soon in this book of, of, of Acts, we're going to see a picture of what that is supposed to look like. But if you're wondering about Jesus, know this. He is building a new community, and he is offering you a new community and a new identity. A community and an identity that cannot be taken from you, that cannot be stripped away that goes beyond the bounds of anything that this world can understand, and it's centered on him, on Jesus. And if you're a follower of Jesus, or if you claim to be a follower of Jesus, be sure of this, you cannot truly go deep into your faith in Jesus. You cannot truly obey him. You cannot really even truly follow him unless you follow him into his creation of this new community. You are called to his global church, and you're called to one of his local churches. The only Christ following there is, is following him into community. And so if you are not a part of the community that Jesus is building, then you need to ask yourself if you are a part of Christ at all. 
the apostles and the first disciples took seriously a replacement for Judas because they knew that Jesus was restoring Israel. They knew Jesus was restoring Israel. And because Jesus was restoring Israel, he was building a new people for himself. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask that your son, Jesus, would be made known in our hearts by faith and that we would be joined to him and so be joined to one another in the community of faith. Help us to understand and to know better the people that he is creating. Help us to not forsake the people that he is creating. But help us to understand that loving his community is a part of loving him. May those who do not know him be intrigued and fascinated by the good work that he is doing and continues to do in our midst and so become his followers. May those who have deceived themselves into thinking his followers but have shown themselves not to be because they have rejected Jesus' community, may they be convicted of that sin and drawn by repentance into the community of faith. And may we who are part of his new community, the church, never lose patience with it because it is, it is the manifestation of Jesus' work in this world and part of his eternal plan of salvation. As Jesus works to build his church, God, may we, by the Spirit, carry out that work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.